If one religion only were allowed in England, the government would very possibly become arbitrary. If there were but two, the people would cut one another's throats. But as there are a multitude, they all live happy and in peace. In this episode of Philosophers Explained by me, Stephen Hicks, we turn to Voltaire's 1733 Letters on England. Voltaire is in exile from France, traveling the country and learning what he can about the English ways and then in turn recommending them as improvements and reforms for the French. Let's go to the text. Voltaire is French, but he is in England, in exile. As a young man, young professional writer, he had angered too many high and mighty people in government in the church. Censorship uh, was uh, common, throwing people into prison for saying the wrong things, publishing the wrong things was also common. Voltaire himself had spent some time in prison. During this uh, round, though, it had been decided that he should be sent into exile, and he went willingly, traveling around England as he chose, meeting as many people as he could to get a sense for what it was that the English that were doing that was so special and had brought them to the attention uh, uh, of everyone around the world. And then very interestingly, what can we French learn from the English, given our, uh, at least from Voltaire's perspective, serious problems and dysfunctionalities. So a series of letters uh, uh, that he wrote, published first in England and then uh, meant for export, of course, across the channel to the continent, especially to France. A series of uh, 24 letters, uh, perhaps 25, some editions will include an additional one. Uh, I want to start by going through the table of contents just quickly to give you a sense of the range of issues that he takes up. So letter one on the Quakers, uh, letter two on the Quakers, letter three on the Quakers, letter four on the Quakers. So four initial letters on the Quakers. Why the Quakers? Well, we'll come back to that question in a moment. <clears throat> then a letter on the Church of England, then on the Presbyterians, and then on the Socinians or Arians or Anti-Trinitarians as they are variously called. So what's interesting here is right off the bat, seven letters devoted to matters of religion, how religion is done in England. And the contrast to how religion is done in France and in much of the continent, that's going to be Voltaire's rhetorical and, of course, philosophical agenda. Then a couple of letters on government, on politics, how uh, the English parliament uh, does its business, the nature of government. One focused on issues of trade. The English were great traders, had become extraordinarily wealthy as a result of that. And then we turn to a series of letters on scientific and philosophical issues, one on inoculation, especially with respect to the smallpox, which uh, ravaged uh, many people in the population, on Francis Bacon, on John Locke, on the French philosopher René Descartes and the English scientist, but very philosophical scientist, Sir Isaac Newton. And then there are a number of uh, letters uh, following uh, that we don't have time for, focusing on letters, the arts, uh, the theater, a mention of Shakespeare and some of the other great literary uh, figures of England at the time. But let's plunge in and start to talk about the Quakers. Why the Quakers? of all religious uh, sects to begin with. Well, they are a version of Christianity, and this is now by the early part of the 1700s, a continent uh, 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 in which there are many, many different versions of Christianity. Uh, and uh, there have been a, uh, two centuries in some places almost of religious conflict, persecution, torture, uh, double and triple standards in the law, and general ill will with respect to, uh, to people of different denominations. I want to suggest that uh, Voltaire is, of course, a philosopher of the first rank, but he's also a polemicist. And uh, one of the reasons why we read him is that we love to read him. He is a great rhetorician. He knows how to use 
words. And so he is always sensitive to the turn of the phrase and how dramatically to uh, illustrate the points by, by the greatest possible contrast. So when he is thinking about religion as it is done in France, by and large still very traditionally, hierarchically, uh, 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 with the, you know, the, the Pope, uh, who's actually in Rome at the top, the cardinals, the archbishops, the bishops, uh, the, the, all the way down to the laity, the many layers in the hierarchy, everything uh, 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 very ceremonialized with fancy clothing and fancy services often done in Latin. So that way of doing religion uh, combined with no yet separation between church and state formally, so politics and religion, uh, uh, you know, to put it bluntly, are in bed with each other, each scratching their backs in various ways. Although, of course, there are more serious arguments that can be made for saying there should be an integration of the two. Voltaire has in mind that the Quakers represent the exact opposite, as far as you can go inside the Christian big tent, uh, uh, in terms of beliefs, in terms of practices, in terms of its rituals. And so he wants to uh, draw strong attention to the contrast between the two. Now, at the same time, this is sensitive territory, and he knows if he ever has aspirations of going back to France, uh, not only will his works be subject to censorship, as they continued to be for his life, but he himself could very well be in physical danger. So one of the things he does is, as a rhetorical device is imagine himself and these are stylized recordings of actual conversations he has, having conversations with various people. And so he puts himself in the perception of being a French person, a true believer in the French way of doing religion, talking to this strange person, this Quaker, with these alien, heretical, odd beliefs. Uh, and the point here, then, is that he will then allow the Quaker to speak in his own voice, without necessarily appearing to endorse or agree. Instead, he can uh, say, oh, I was scandalized by this uh, thing that this person said, although, of course, we know it's Voltaire, and he's not at all scandalized. He's suggesting in many cases that the Quaker way of doing things is better than the French religious ways of doing things. And in fact, reform of how religion is done in France is the right way to go. So we plunge in. I made a visit to one of the most eminent Quakers in England, who, after having traded 30 years, had the wisdom to prescribe limits to his fortune and to his desires, and was settled in a little solitude not far from London. Now, an interesting person. So here's a, a Quaker. How are we going to portray this Quaker? Well, he was in trade, and of course, the English have a reputation for being traders all over the world and being interested in wealth and money and so forth. And so uh, uh, perhaps we might then say, oh, well, they're just greedy and uh, this money-making desire is overwhelming them. But this is a person who went into trade, made his money, but then had good wisdom about what he wants to do with his life. I have made enough money, and so I'm going to stop going into business, and I am going to do other things in my life. So a person who is wise, uh, in control of his appetites, uh, his desires, not controlled by them, and nonetheless successful in the world. Uh, religious people, sometimes we have the stereotype of them as starving themselves, as being ascetic, not interested in uh, uh, so on, and, and therefore being sickly and a little bit a physical. Instead, note the physical description of the Quaker we get here. He was a hale, ruddy, complexioned old man who had never been afflicted by sickness, a perfect stranger to intemperance. So, a healthy guy who uh, 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 and looking healthy and had never been sick uh, a day in his life apparently. So a different kind of uh, a religious stereotype uh, has to be questioned here. He was dressed like those of his persuasion in a plain coat. Contrast the French Catholics who are very much uh, uh, wearing fancy dress and robes and fancy hats and jewelry and uh, of various sorts and staffs of office. Very big on fashion here. It's plain, simple clothing. 
He did not uncover himself when I appeared and advanced toward me without once stooping his body, but there appeared more politeness in the open, humane air of his countenance than in the custom of drawing one leg behind the other. So we know the French way of being polite, uh, particularly if you are dealing with people who are of different rank, well, you take your hat off in their presence. You bow very so, and then, then, and then the lower you are, the closer to the ground you are supposed to bow. Instead, the Quaker does not do any of that. You take him as he is. He walks towards you, offers his hand for, uh, for, for, for shaking. He's greeting you as an equal, as ordinary people would and should, Voltaire is suggesting, do. Now, Voltaire then uh, pretends to get right down to business. I'm here for serious religious discussion. My dear sir, said I, <clears throat> were you ever baptized? I never was, replied the Quaker, nor any of my brethren. Zounds, say I to him, you are not Christians then. Okay, serious accusation, not baptized. How can you possibly be a Christian. Of course, the standard French approach to Christianity, French Catholicism, is saying baptism is absolutely essential. And in this case, we have apparent Christians who have dispensed entirely with the baptism practice. Friend, replies the old man in a soft tone of voice, swear not. We are Christians and endeavor to be good Christians. But we are not of the opinion that the sprinkling of water of, on a child's head makes him a Christian. Heavens, say I, shocked at his impiety. All right, so Voltaire then, in the persona he has created for himself, is the one who is doctrinaire, dogmatic, all passionate and emotional in his responses. And the Quaker is the one who is sober, calm, measured. Right? Not swearing, not taking the Lord's name in vain, and making a perfectly good point. Why would sprinkling water on a child's head you know, have anything to do with cleansing of sin, right, and whatever? So, a reasonable question being here. But uh, Voltaire then goes on to uh, make this sarcastic point, but rhetorically serious. I pitied very much the sincerity of my worthy Quaker, and was absolutely for forcing him to get himself christened. All right, so playing the part of the true believer in French Catholicism, taking pity on this person here, and then uh, rather than being tolerant, uh, uh, kind of poking fun at the usual attitude of, therefore, anybody who disagrees on religious matters, we have to force them to do the right thing. But the argument continues. Uh, likewise, Paul, the great apostle of the Gentiles, uh, says, well, well, we quote scripture, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And indeed, Paul never baptized but two persons with water, and that very much against his inclinations. So uh, pointing out scripture, we have this baptism practice, but why uh, on scriptural authority do you think it is so absolutely important, absolutely essential when many of the founders of Christianity themselves uh, did not engage much in baptizing and didn't seem to put great store by it. So there is then an invitation to go back to the text and read it for ourselves and talk about what the text actually does and doesn't say and how to interpret it. We shouldn't simply take a tradition that has been sanctioned for ages by higher authority as the true and think that we cannot possibly question it. Well, Voltaire doesn't have an answer to this, or at least the persona of Voltaire does not have a, 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 an answer to this, and so he's going to just kind of set that issue, issue aside. But he circumcised his disciple Timothy, and the other disciples likewise were circumcised, all who were willing to submit to that carnal ordinance. This is now the Quaker speaker speaking. But are thou circumcised, added he, speaking to Voltaire. I have not the honor to be so, say I. Well, friend, continues the Quaker, thou art a Christian without being circumcised, and I am one without being 
baptized. So uh, if Voltaire then wants to argue on behalf of, uh, of, uh, of, of doctrinaire Christianity that you have to be baptized, well, then it seems that you would also have to be circumcised. But do you clearly have not opted for the circumcision? So are you not being inconsistent in some way? And so we can further go along with this argument, right? Or we can say, you know, look, it might be a matter of true Christianity, true religion, not be a, a matter of slavishly following some actions that happen to be mentioned a few times in the Bible. Maybe for true religion, we look somewhere else. Now, in the persona here, Voltaire uh, uh, recognizes the author, rather, that he is uh, raising, of course, some controversial points, uh, 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 but he's not going to endorse this position. He's going to suggest it for further thought and reflection in his readers without endorsing it. And then once again, he pretends to react the way a, uh, a true believer would react. Well, I had more sense than to contest with him since there is no possibility of convincing an enthusiast Right. When, in fact, interestingly, it's the Quaker who's being sober and reasonable here. It's the persona of Voltaire that's being the, the, uh, the enthusiast here. The Quaker then continues, it was not till many ages after that men, right, uh, who would have employed the word you as though they were double instead of thou employed in speaking to them. And sort of all of these linguistic niceties, the Quakers are also noted for plain, direct, speech instead of all of the flattering titles and so forth. And so the Quaker goes on to say, look, it, these traditions that come along that get piled on basic or true Christianity, all of those we have dispensed with as well. The flattering titles of lordship, of eminence, and of holiness, which mere worms bestow on other worms by assuring them that they are with a most profound respect and an infamous falsehood, their most humble, obedient servants. So this uh, uh, layered on uh, fancy language with all of these flattering uh, titles, it is a falsehood. They are lying. People say them without really meaning them. And so that's why we Quakers have dispensed with them. We speak honestly and plainly. It is to secure ourselves more strongly from such a shameless traffic of lies and flattery that we, thee and thou, a king, with the same freedom as we do a beggar. We speak to everyone with the same titles rather than, so we are much more equality oriented rather than hierarchy. And the higher up someone is in the hierarchy, the more we pretend that this is a super special person and pile on all of the, the linguistic titles and flattery. Our apparel is also somewhat different from that of others. Uh, others wear the badges and marks of their several dignities and we those of Christian humility. We fly from all assemblies of pleasure and from diversions of every kind and from places where gaming is practiced. So we don't put on airs, we don't put on fancy clothes, we don't put on fancy badges, we don't engage in uh, uh, you know, drinking and gambling and going with prostitutes and so forth as we know secretly and hypocritically many people who are so-called in the religious hierarchy back in France do on a regular basis. We never swear, we never war or fight in any case. All right, so an interesting content and rhetorical contrast between the Christian religion as practiced by Quakers and the known practice back in France. And the question is going to be how a reasonable person reading this would respond. Would they say, obviously, the Quaker is a heretic and not at all a Christian, and we need to do, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, intolerant, forceful things with respect to this person and suppress all of them? Or would we say, well, maybe, uh, maybe they have a point. Maybe we should accept them as being a different version of Christianity, enact some sort of tolerance, and perhaps even reform our own uh, practices of religion here. Letter two, uh, he gets invited to go to a Quaker meeting. <clears throat> I was greatly surprised to see him come Sunday following and take me with him to the Quakers meeting. 
And so again, we're supposed to imagine a, uh, the contrast. Uh, uh, if we imagine a French cathedral, a huge space, very high windows, very ornate, highly decorated, all sorts of riches on display, everything very ceremonialized. At the one end, there's an elevated place where the priest is going to speak. And then the rest of the people are at a lower level, resuggesting the, the hierarchy. Uh, 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 and, and of course, everything pointing up hierarchically toward the God. Instead, what we find here is all were seated and the silence was universal. I passed through them, but did not perceive so much as one lift up his eyes to look at me. So they are in their religious place. They are there to contemplate, to think about uh, whatever matters concern them in this place of worship. They're not there primarily for socialize. Oh, who's this new stranger coming in to visit and so forth? They are quiet. They are focused on what they are there to focus on. Then, shockingly, this silence lasted a quarter of an hour when at last one of them rose up, took off his hat, and after making a variety of wry faces and groaning in a most lamentable manner, he, partly from his nose and partly from his mouth, threw out a strange, confused jumble of words, borrowed as he imagined from the gospel, which neither he himself nor any of his hearers understood. So we have a spontaneous individual who then stands up and speaks what seems to be meaningless nonsense, right, or speaking in tongues. And so Voltaire is, uh, is taken aback by this. And so he asks this question, Oh, what's going on right with this guy? And the Quaker's response is, well, uh, when we think the spirit of God has moved within us uh, or that God wants to use us to communicate, we allow the spirit of God to work through. Uh, it's not uh, something that can be forced. Uh, it is an individual in relationship to God who speaks whatever God wants him to speak. Well, uh, how do you know who's right and who's wrong, uh, whether he's uh, a fraud, whether he's uh, really speaking uh, 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 as God wants him to? And the Quaker responds, well, that's not any of my business to judge whether this person is true or false. That is a private issue of the relationship between God and the individual. And again, what we have is a strong suggestion here on this individual relationship to God that anybody can speak to God, and anybody can be spoken to God, rather than the traditional French and Catholic way of there being in a church or in a cathedral one person who speaks, the priest, and the priest tells you, the rest of the congregation, what God wants, uh, what the scripture says, what the scripture means, what God's message is, and the rest of the people uh, uh, come to their relationship with God through scripture, through the priest, through the hierarchy, a much more communal and hierarchical understanding of religion. That is what Quakerism challenges. Voltaire notes then uh, and puts in the, the Quaker's mouth, we even allow our women to hold forth. So women are individuals. They can have their own relationship with God, and uh, it's, a, it's an equal standing religiously in the eyes of God, uh, men and women, as opposed to much of traditional religion, which had, of course, subordinated women to males within uh, the institution of the church. Voltaire, the persona of Voltaire, you have no priests then, say I to him. No, no, friend, replies the priest, to our great happiness. It's an individual responsibility, not a socially hierarchical responsibility that is delegated and one is obedient to people in the hierarchy for what one is to believe and what one is to do. But how is it possible for you, say I, with some warmth, to know whether your discourse is really inspired by the Almighty? And again, the Quaker responds, whosoever says he shall implore Christ to enlighten him and shall publish the gospel truths, he may feel inwardly. Such an one may be assured that he is inspired by the Lord. 
one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. And uh, if you are not uh, 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 inside that person's mind or inside that soul, that is not your business. Your business is to cultivate your own individual relationship with the God. And then, uh, of course, uh, Voltaire recognizes that once again, this is potentially blasphemous material, heretical material from the standpoint of traditional Christianity uh, in, uh, in, in France. And so he does soften the blow a little bit by pointing out a famous French philosopher, Malbranche, who had argued somewhat a similar thing. Why this, said I, is Malbranche's doctrine to a tittle. Now, more on the Quakers and the contrast, but the idea here is clearly the Quakers represent one pole of Christianity, French Catholicism, another pole of Christianity. We are investigating both of them. Uh, is Quakerism clearly unchristian? Is it clearly something that is false? Is it clearly something that is immoral, blasphemous? Is it something that should be suppressed? Or should perhaps we French rethink some of our attitudes with respect to religion, alter some of our beliefs, alter some of our doctrines, and perhaps socially and politically be more open and tolerant? That's uh, the lesson from the English uh, that Voltaire wants the French to learn. He notices the uh, the influence of the Quakers not only in in uh, in uh, in England, but that uh, in uh, in in America uh, it was a Quaker, the William William Penn, who had gone over and uh, obviously uh, uh, important in the founding of what came to be Pennsylvania, but uh, uh, arguing that Penn was influential on certain cultural practices in America, establishing there the same Quaker principles of universal toleration with respect to an individual's conscience. And so uh, the influence of the Quakers is now international. He had established a universal toleration with regard to conscience in America. And this is now in the early, uh, or sorry, in the in the 1600s. And what is going on then in America, this establishing of toleration of different forms of Christian and non-Christian religion, that also is uh, uh, going on in parallel to what had happened in England. William III and Parliament, uh, his uh, Parliament, uh, the toleration, this is now 16. 89. So, universal toleration and a significant separation of church and state, uh, religion and politics, that's happening in England, it's also happening in America, to the credit of those two places, perhaps we French can learn from them. All right, now we turn to the Church of England. Uh, England has not uh, totally separated church and state. It has a, uh, enacted widespread religious toleration, but there still is an official religion of the realm that is the Church of England. And many of its doctrines and practices, it is quite similar to traditional Catholicism. But nonetheless, the important point here is that this established church is tolerant uh, of many of the other religions out there. England is properly the country of sectorists. In my father's house are many mansions. An Englishman as one to whom liberty is natural may go to heaven in his own way. So religious freedom, religious liberty for every individual, uh, also extending equally to uh, individuals of all political and social classes, crossing the sex divide, applying equally to men and to women. This is the English way of doing religion. Now, we then might say, oh, yes, but uh, if we give people too much liberty and too much freedom, then uh, uh, aren't people just going to do whatever they feel like and individuals will then be moral? Maybe we need to have a more uniform, top-down, perhaps even imposed religion for the purpose of morality. And Voltaire goes on to uh, argue that if you look at the morality of the English people, that uh, it is at least as good as that of the French people. If you look at the morality of the English clergy, Voltaire suggests that it is better than that of the French clergy on average. With regard to the morals of the English clergy, they are more regular than those of France. 
Uh, employments here are bestowed both in the church and the army as a reward for long service. So the point seems to be that in order to get a position in the English church, uh, you have to prove yourself worthy by actually accomplishing some things, rather than what Voltaire is suggesting is the common French practice of nepotism and political and religious appointments to relatively young people. If you know the right people or if you have the right amount of money, then even if you're a young person with no experience of the world, suddenly you can have this uh, fairly exalted position in the French uh, a, a religious establishment, and that is not conducive to good morals. Most of the clergy are married, so uh, all of the perhaps sexual oddness and sometimes sexual perversity that can be characteristic of certain forms of, uh, of religion that uh, have certain uh, attitudes with respect to sexu sexuality and require vows of celibacy and so forth. The argument that the English more commonsensically say, well, you know, we are, we are, met, we are we're human beings, we are men, we are women, why not let them get married? They can, uh, of course, enjoy sexual pleasure within the confines of their marriage. Maybe that's going to be healthier morally and uh, take away a certain amount of the sexual weirdness that uh, sometimes uh, is characteristic of some denominations. And with respect to, uh, to drinking, uh, clergymen in England sometimes take a glass at the tavern. So perhaps the point is moderation, enjoying earthly pleasures, and expecting people to be able to uh, self-responsibly regulate themselves instead of this, oh, it's, it's totally evil and totally wrong uh, attitude, and we need to be teetotalers, which of course can bring its own weirdnesses with it. Moving on now to the uh, Presbyterians, uh, uh, more prominent up in Scotland, uh, but then also uh, moving down south further into England and other parts of Britain. Though the Episcopal uh, and the Presbyterian sects are the two prevailing ones in Great Britain, yet all the others are very welcome to come and settle in it, and they live sociably together. So there are many sects and the British have somehow worked out religious tolerance and gotten past the centuries of religious wars that uh, Europe had, had suffered through. Now, that is to say the average British person uh, is quite tolerant. Of course, when you get inside the religions, you'll have your own true believers and zealots, and in some cases, fanatics as well, who as representatives of the religion will, uh, will, will, uh, will hate each other, just as coming back to France, the Jansenists and the Jesuits often hate each other. And as a mark, interestingly, of the British culture, uh, with its emphasis on economics, on trade, on doing business, and so forth, uh, Voltaire has this oft-quoted passage coming here. The relationship between religious toleration and business. Take a view of the Royal Exchange in London, a place more venerable than many courts of justice where the representatives of all nations meet for the benefit of mankind. So pausing right there, noticing that we have in the discussion here of the market, the stock market, a benevolent view of the stock market. It's doing good for mankind. Commerce is a, is a healthy thing. But then with respect to religion, most more remarkably, there the Jew, the Mahometan, and the Christian transact together as though they all professed the same religion and give the name of infidel to none but bankrupts. There, the Presbyterian confides in the Anabaptist and the churchman depends on the Quaker's word. So why is it in places where we take religion seriously and we have all of these laws and regulations and in many cases, uh, long-standing cultural traditions of hating each other uh, with respect to religion, when we go into the commercial realm, when we go into trade, suddenly people can get along with each other despite their religious backgrounds. So there's a suggestion here and an early formulation about uh, business and peace or commerce and toleration, that those two are natural bedfellows. And then the fun remark, if one religion only were allowed in religion, the government would very possibly become arbitrary Right. Monopolized religion is dangerous. If there were but two, the people would cut each one another's throats. But as there are such a multitude, they all live 
happy and in peace. So a very strong suggestion that if we want to have peace, social peace, we should have a plurality of religion and, and expect there to be a plurality of religions. And out of that, we will get social police. Any sort of duopoly or monopoly with respect to religion, that traditionally is the dangerous attitude, but of course, one that many religions push for. We want to monopolize people's religious lives all the way down. Get past that attitude, Voltaire is suggesting we can be peaceful.